You're listening to Table for Five with Felicia and Annette, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello. Good morning. Good Monday morning, everyone. <laughs> there was a different uh, little icon that popped up there, so I could not see us. But good morning, everyone. Good, good morning. Monday morning, yes. everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Table for Five with Felicia and Annette. And Heidi. And Heidi. Woo! Yes, she's an original co-host. Table yes, for Five from back in the day. We have an OG at the table. OG. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> from way back on the day. Yeah. Yes. 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 So today is Monday, May 7th, 2018. We are live here. Everyone go. We're on Facebook uh, right now and LA Talk Radio if you want to see and listen to and watch us live. Um, But welcome everyone to our show, Table for Five, and where you, the listening and viewing audience, will always have a seat right here at this table. our table. Table for Five. All of our great conversations and everything that we've got going on. There's a lot going on this morning. It is. It's exciting. Listen, and we're not going to do really hot topics or anything today today. because we have a full show and we need, I need like every single (laughs) moment (laughs) of this hour (laughs) because I I don't fan out. I'm going to let y'all know right now. This is my disclaimer. I do not fan out like movie star people. They don't phase me. Groupie. <sighs> but Julie. I do every now and again, but that's okay. Go ahead. But this author, Julie, is like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Julie, so don't excited. hang up. Please don't <laughs> hang up. Amazing. She's harmless. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really am. I'm just a little, you know, geeked out this morning. All right, you're going to scare um, her. <laughs> That's I'm enough not gonna scare her. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, but before we get started, uh, we want to let you know a few things. Yes, we want to let you know. Us. Yeah, about where to find us. All of you know we are on Facebook at Felicia and Annette Table for Five. Also, all our social media platforms, which are Instagram at Table for Five, our Twitter, which is at Table for Five, our YouTube, which is Table for Five TV, and what I like to call our one-stop shop, which is our website, which is where you can go and find out about us. Us, a little bit about us, who we are, what mm-hmm. we like, what we don't like. You can go to the <laughs> original shows because they actually are on there. Um, and you can find out if you want to uh, advertise with us. There's a little <coughs> tab. You just click on it and you just read what the offerings are. And then someone very professional will get back to you. Yes. <laughs> yes. And speaking of sponsors and uh, advertising, I'm going to take a little break here to let you know um, our first sponsor. To, so today's show is being brought to you in part by soul of a woman dot blog a conversation between the reader and writer and reader and writer yeah <laughs> a conversation oh. that comes from a woman's perspective a blog to inspire encourage and entertain soul yes. of a woman dot blog is our first sponsor for today um an in-studio guest so i'm just going to jump right in yes. like normally we talk about our weekends and stuff yeah, but we're i not did doing have that. a very pointed weekend because i saw an amazing play yesterday but uh, we're not even going to talk about that. Um, so in-studio guest today is the wonderful the Heidi, Heidi Benito. Benito. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes. We have sound effects. I'm feeling very special. Our budget is getting yes. bigger and bigger. Nice. Yes, we do. And today we are talking to um, a wonderful, amazing author, author Miss Julie Lithcott-Hames. Good morning, Julie. Are you there? I am here, and <laughs> you guys are making, y'all, I'm trying not to use gendered language anymore, y'all are making my morning, <laughs> your enthusiasm <laughs> for me good. is making me feel so good about myself. Of course, so thank uh, you. yes. Awesome. Well, I'm just going to read a quick little bio so that everybody know uh, yes. what you're about. So, uh, Julie Lithcott Hames, she holds a BA in American Studies from Stanford University, a JD from Harvard Law School and an MFA in writing from California College of the Arts. She served as Dean of Freshman and Undergraduate Advising at Stanford University. She's a member of the San Francisco Writers Writers Grotto, and she lives in Silicon Valley with her partner of close to 30 years and uh, two teenagers and her mom. Mm -hmm. Welcome this morning. Welcome, Julie, (laughs) to our show, our humble little show. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us, Um, and today, We're going to be discussing both of your books. Mm -hmm. Um, Originally, we were introduced to you by your first book, um, How to Raise an Adult. Yes. Breaking Free of the of the Helicopter Parenting. Yes. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. Sorry. Um, And that was like amazing in and of itself. And then you wrote another book (laughs) between the time that we read that one. Yes. uh, Real American. 
And so we're going to be talking to you about both books today. So the plan, I think, is to do like 30 minutes for each book. Yeah. I don't know if, if that's we're gonna, okay. Yeah. Hopefully we won't get into an argument up here between the three of us because yeah. we tend to that do that sometimes. Happens. We have all <laughs> the interesting thing. I'll just tell you a quick, really uh, quick background on how we stumbled <coughs> upon your book. I was in Barnes & Noble looking for a book and the cover and the color stood out. So I picked it up and I have an adult son and I have a teenage boy and I thought okay I'm sure I messed up the adult son let me try <laughs> to figure out how to not mess it up with the teenager <laughs> and I read your book and literally after I read your book I apologized to my oldest for everything that I had <laughs> done to him oh and um, and I thought okay I gotta <laughs> fix this but then I tell Felicia Felicia you gotta read this book it's life-changing and she's like I'm not reading that book yeah, there's I was no not, way I'm not doing that well, because not. I was like I'm a helicopter parent I'm gonna own it I'll take that title I'm gonna hover all day long, every day, Black Hawk down, whatever. <laughs> I don't really yes. care. The success and of your sons <laughs> is solely relying exactly. on Julie. Yes. Okay? Exactly. Yes. You have nothing to do with it. Oh at this my point. gosh! No pressure, Julie. Really. So, uh, in any event, she <laughs> did pick up the book. I did, and she read it, and was. I did. I read it and I listened to it because yeah. I, that's my other disclaimer. I don't like to read. This one is a reader. Yeah. I hate to read. I don't read unless forced to, which this wasn't really forced, but I there's an amazing thing, which is books on audio. And I love that you did the audio too. Mm -hmm. Like you read your book. That's amazing. I don't know. It just really got me into it. I'm very excited. <laughs> So she she reads your book, realizes, okay, this is this is this is something that I really need to think about. And yes. then she goes to Heidi School at Sierra Canyon, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And they and there you were speaking. Yes. yes. And Felicia <coughs> approached you. They both got their book signed, yes. which I don't. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sex and to be you. <laughs> yes, I know. I couldn't make it that day. And then Felicia met you, connected, and then here we are. Yes. The, a very long road. What a journey, I know. ladies. What a journey. <laughs> we were, I'm so delighted. I feel lucky. Yes, you're oh. kidding. Get out of here with that. Yeah. We're the lucky ones. And okay. what a powerful, can I just say, yeah. what a powerful speaker she is. I mean, she had that whole, you could hear a pin drop in that room. <gasps> yeah. Like parents oh, yeah. were just hanging on to every word. It was very, very informative. Yeah, was I amazing. was very emotional. <laughs> uh, you made me cry. I, I will probably cry today. I think she's going to cry right now. <laughs> probably. No, I'm not going to cry right uh, now. I just like. <laughs> yeah, she's my throat. <clears throat> but, All right. So, but I have to All say, right. we picked up, we want to talk, I want to talk about the real, uh, real American, a yes. memoir, because I finished it and literally, I, w while I was reading it, and I don't know if anybody said this to you, um, but I felt like I was reading poetry the mm -hmm. whole time. Mm -hmm. Like every page, the way it's set up, it's like you're turning a page into a, uh, just a sonat, a sonnet, a sonnet. Um, and one of the things that I wrote down when I finished reading it, I said, poignant, honest, brutally transparent, gut-wrenching gut at times. I feel like I was reading poetry and I felt like I was reading an open letter to your complex identity as you were looking in a mirror, looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. So you kind of wrote it and allowed us to, you brought us into your world of your identity and I, I was reading it and I thought to myself, there were moments where you were so honest that I, did you lose the friends? Did you, <laughs> did people stop right. talking to you after you were so honest about how they responded to you? There were several instances um, that I thought, wow, if that person read it, I don't know if you told them, hey, before I'm gonna write that moment happened mm -hmm. in the kitchen or at that party that you were mm -hmm. for the school. Um, I just thought it was so transparent and, you know, sometimes when you write Very stuff brave. like that, yeah, you kind of, people will get insulted or offended. So I don't, and so, so my question to you is, when you wrote it and it was out there for everybody to read, what was the response from those that are included in the book? I'm gonna offer a very blunt initial response, which is, I've decided my primary concern is not to care. Mm. Nice. Okay? I am now 50 years old. Nice. I have lived this black and biracial life where I was made to feel less worthy, um, untrustworthy, mm. suspicious, uh, undeserving of whatever, you know, opportunities I had. Mm -hmm. And I have finally come to discard all of that, mm. the impact racism had on me and my sense of self 
Mm-hmm. And I'm at this point where I'm saying, I don't know what language I'm allowed to use in this oh, you medium. Oh, anything. Anything. This is it. uncensored. <laughs> right? <laughs> Woo, yeah. go. It's like, I'm here to live out loud. This mm. is my truth. This yes. is my reality. And I'm no longer trying to make it easy for them, yes. which is how I spent 40 years of my life. Yeah. So um, that's the blunt answer. The more nuanced answer is <laughs> for uh, example the story you refer to in the kitchen mm-hmm. you know with a beloved um, you know close friend of the family who said something really horrible yeah. I circled back to her you know before the book came out and said hey mm-hmm. I've written this mm-hmm. I've you know kind of uh, changed the details so no one will know it's you but you'll know it's you mm-hmm. and um you know, I, I gave her that heads up and it led to a, you know, a good conversation about her, you know, her anguish, her regret, mm. her apology. Um, but the apology didn't stop me from needing to put it in the book because mm-hmm. what what needed to be in the book was the impact it had on me when she right. said it. Right. Yes. In right. terms of the other example, the party here in Palo Alto, the blackface yeah. lady shows up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These are my neighbors, <sighs> Yeah. you know, Gosh. and frankly they didn't care what it was like for me then i don't care what it's like for them now yeah and um you know the bigger issue is i'm in a town where these things happen but is there a town where these things don't happen absolutely you know um you know it it gets to meta issues for me around where do i find community and with whom and who do i who do i choose to uh, draw near to me and who do i decide i can walk past that situation yeah. and not you know invite it further into my life so fundamentally the ability to tell these stories um is the result of my having done the work mm-hmm. to love myself despite the shit that happened well, yeah. through pain comes empowerment yeah. right and yes you know. yes that's fantastic. Now, do you feel like writing the real America or writing how to raise an adult first that gave you kind of um, I don't know, did it, did it make it easier for you? Did it make it more comfortable? Was it a catalyst or did you always kind of know that you would do this? Because I know that you I don't know, I, I want to say I, I got the sense from reading the book that it was kind of like many years in the work. You, you know, you wrote, you wrote your thesis and uh, college and you know you were kind of doing this work all along maybe not really knowing it um, but then after you know right coming out with how to raise an adult and the success of it did that did you always know that you were going to do this next did it how did that play a part in it Felicia you've summarized it so beautifully and in some ways I'm still learning about my own process as I live it and as I look back on it. So here's what I can tell you I know to be true. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to get an MFA at California College of the Arts in 2012 because I wanted to write a book on the harm of helicopter parenting, which I was seeing the effects of on the college campus where I work. As people were seeing it all over the nation, I happened to be seeing it at Stanford. And I wasn't confident in my writing. I've been given feedback throughout my life that my writing needed a lot of work. And the people who gave me that feedback, they were right. And I had been working hard at becoming a more um, close reader, which made me a better writer and so on. So anyway, I went to write that anti-helicopter parenting book. Um, and I got a book deal while I was doing my MFA, which is amazing. I put the MFA down. I, mean, I went from full-time to very, very part-time mm-hmm. to write this book because I this book, you know, a helicopter parenting book isn't really something you can bring into your poetry class or workshop <laughs> right. or your playwriting. Right. Mm-hmm. Narrative nonfiction. You know, so I was getting guidance in my, in my one-on-one mentoring and in, in one class or two on writing that book, but I kind of wrote that book on the side while I was a student. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, when I wasn't writing about helicopter parenting, what was coming up now of me more than any other topic was raised. Mm-hmm. And so to your point and to, you know, to the larger issue of writing memoir, you know, the, the quip is, yeah, we've been writing it all our life. This is our life. I've been writing it all my life in some ways. Um, I began volitionally writing about it, these issues of race, rather recently, and I detail some of them in the book, mm-hmm. you know, an awful experience in 2005 that made me really fear that, you know, my own insecurities around race were really going to have a negative impact on my children who are quite little mm-hmm. that led me to start writing an essay about about race and then here i am in 2012 2013 2014 writing poetry and 
and I published my first poem, which is a seven voice poem, a mm-hmm. uh, polyvocal poem told in seven different typefaces uh, about my high school experiences around race, mm-hmm. all of which made its way into real American ultimately. Right. Um, so I did my thesis. I didn't want how to raise an adult to be my thesis. Mm. I wanted my, my master's thesis to be brave. And I didn't think a helicopter parenting book was brave or took courage. Although mm. there are a lot of people who are antagonistic toward the ideas I've raised in that book. It didn't require, a, I wasn't personally accountable in the way mm. I am uh, and having written a memoir on race. So, um, so the, the real American in its actual form came very quickly. Mm. I wrote it starting in January of 2016. Mm. I sold it to my publisher the mm-hmm. summer of 2016. Mm. Uh, she, you know, wanted me to add things, take away things. She even said, you know, Donald Trump is going to be a footnote to history yes. by the time this book comes yes. out. So you might Oof. take out references to him because you don't want your book to sound dated the minute yes. it is published because you referred to a guy no one remembers. And of course, he became president. So wow. we yeah. revised the book through April of 2017. And oh, wow. I'm turning a word document into a book, and it came out in October. So for about 15 months, and which is pretty quick, I yeah. think, and, yeah. which includes the revision. Yeah. So a long time coming, and a lot of you know early bits uh, written earlier, but t- you know very a very small portion of the book was mm-hmm. written before I began actually writing it 2016. Gotcha. And that's interesting that you mentioned that about the timeline of it, because <laughs> actually one of my first questions to you was, uh, did the pending election have anything to do with the title of the book and how you speak about being American? And at one point in the book, your uh, citizenship is like questioned mm-hmm. in, uh, I believe it was in, was it in high, in college? Um, and yeah. You know, and it just when I saw that you were coming out with this new book and I read it, the title, and I thought the first thing I thought about was Donald Trump and his whole campaign and America great again and America this and America that. And so I just that was my first question to you. So what 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 is your answer? Do you think uh, how, how did the title of the book and the election come together at all or were there any correlations? Yeah, correlations, but I would say before Donald Trump ever talked about making America great again, Sarah Palin was out there having been, mm. for some unfathomable reason, Remember elected her? by John McCain <laughs> to be his, and you know today he's regretting that, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. to be his <laughs> vice presidential candidate. There she was with her nasty rhetoric mm-hmm. around real Americans, deserve this and that real Americans believe this and that and yeah. I knew every time she uttered that term mm. she was not talking about me and people mm. like me and millions of others whom mm-hmm. she and those like her regard as interlopers mm-hmm. into America those who aren't really belonging here and mm-hmm. so I was incensed the minute people started using that term as a way to um, carve us up um, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and discard some of us and so I'm wrestling the term back for all of us I am Mm. reclaiming that term I think the word American needs to be modified to real but as long as people are doing that I'm reclaiming and the other reason I I, and so Donald Trump was you know an inheritor (laughs) some ways of rhetoric that um, Sarah Palin and others um, had been using a little bit earlier Mm -hmm the descendant of an of a slave named Sylvie Mm -hmm. and I am Sylvie's great 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 granddaughter Mm -hmm. dedicate this book to Sylvie because Mm -hmm. even though she lived in Charleston South Carolina in the late 1700s when America was becoming formed as America even though they considered her three-fifths of a human you know for purposes of the white men and those in those states having mm-hmm. the right amount of representation in Congress, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Even though my great-great-great-great-grandma was considered three-fifths of a human, she was whole to me. Absolutely. She made me a seventh-generation American. Absolutely. And no amount of their vitriol and rhetoric from her or from me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Good for you. Absolutely. So this might, <clears throat> I know you've heard it all in the media the past couple of days or week and a half, 
having read your book and knowing your history and uh, and the story behind Sylvie, um, w with the comments lately that have been flying around with uh, slavery was a choice, how did you <laughs> react to that, having written this Lord book? Jesus. and from because I love how you created a timeline in this book because you brought it yes. from the moment you your parents met or before actually and who they are and then you threaded it into them meeting and their lives and then your life and then you brought it to current day right uh, with all the, the people who've suffered at the hands of, mm -hmm. uh, of America mm -hmm. and now we're up to this step where we go what slavery was a choice and I guess the what what made me get a little fearful when I heard that was how people kind of backed that up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just white folks that were backing it up, it was also African-American black folks saying, yeah, you know what, maybe it was a choice. Like, how mm -hmm. do, uh, when, you when you write that kind of book and, you <laughs> and you're an educator and then you hear this, how do, you, how do we yeah. bring that back? How do we put the genie back in the bottle? Like, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you yeah. go up against that? For our young people who are listening to that, who, who idolize people who say these kind of things. Well, there's no clearer evidence of the ignorance of many, many people in America mm -hmm. than that statement, mm -hmm. all right? This is evidence of how inadequate our educational system is. Mm -hmm. This is evidence yeah. that people don't read books. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's evidence that they don't read fiction, mm -hmm. they don't read history, mm -hmm. they don't read memoir, okay? So mm -hmm. it's just, I'm sorry, Kanye, but thanks for showing us how ignorant you are. Exactly. You know, the, sure the like Af high five <laughs> African <laughs> made yeah. and then their African American descendants made to rise up, to overthrow, mm -hmm. to run away, you know, are numerous. The accounts of what our people endured during slavery, the ways in which their bodies were mutilated, yep. that infants and children ripped away from their mothers as their mothers stood naked on auction blocks. Yep. I mean, this was the most dehumanizing set of atrocities. I won't say the most. I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, this was the worst thing that ever happened in the history of humans. But it is among the very most Absolutely. awful things sure. humans have done to other humans. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. yep. So, a choice, you know, Yeah. <laughs> I won't even dignify that with further comment. Right. right. Yeah. Um, um, you yeah. know, and this brings me to the argument you often hear from Irish Americans on Twitter who say, you know, get over it. We were <laughs> enslaved, too. And the truth is yeah. they were not mm. enslaved in America. They were highly loathed as Catholics in the time when white Protestant, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant was a thing to be. They were highly loathed. They were made indentured servants. And then, as historians have taught us, when the indentured white folks and the enslaved and indentured black folks began colluding and saying, hey, this is awful, mm -hmm. you know, how do we get out from under these terrible conditions? The white folks who ran the show said to the indentured white folks, hey, you, you're not, you don't need to collaborate with the blacks because you're white. Hmm. Right. And even though you're lowly and even though you have to work for us for a period of years, these black folks, yeah. they're indentured to us for life. Forever. That's called slavery. They can yeah. never get out. Yeah. Yeah. And so they use whiteness as a way to tell the Irish, oh, no, 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 even though you're lowly and we loathe you, don't collude with the blacks because at least you're white. Mm. This yeah. whole invention of whiteness yeah. as a way to propagate an, an economic yeah. system um, was, you know, a very deliberately constructed thing, and the vestiges of it are with us up to this present moment. Hmm, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now, switching gears just a little bit, I have to say, for me, reading this book, Real American, um, was very, uh, I don't know, I don't even want to say eye-opening, um, but just I want to speak to my personal experience because you are a mixed person. I'm a mixed person. But when if someone were to look at you and someone were to look at me, I felt um, very connected to uh, like almost everything that you said in this book being of mixed race. And but but the difference is, is that you identified more with like it seemed like being black all of your life. And for me, what I was taking from this book and reading from it was I learned very early on, not early in my childhood, I would say early in my adulthood, that that wasn't going to serve me well. Because I think in the beginning of the show, 
you spoke of being um, not trusted. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very poignant and a lot of people don't understand that being a mixed person, not really looking a certain way or fitting in a certain way, you all, you go through life, and I just kind of realized this reading this book, not, not, not even not fitting into either race or really anywhere, but you're never fully trusted. You walk into a room full of white people and they look at me and they're like, yeah, you're not really white, I don't really know what you are, but either way, you're not like me. And then I walk into a room full of black people and they're like, oh, who invited the white girl? <laughs> what is she doing here? <laughs> Um, and yeah, we're not going to trust you either. And like, so I feel like walking through my life, I learned early on not to be committed to anybody because I got so much shit from both places that I was so done with it by the time I got to college. And I took my first African-American history study and learned all of this information that nobody taught me in high school. Yeah. And I was so pissed. I was like, where the fuck was this information four years ago? Right. And why aren't we all talking about right. it? And it was at that moment that I decided to call myself mulatto, which even now people have the audacity to take issue with. And I have to say to them, uh, you can kiss my ass because I'm going to identify and call myself whatever it is that I want to because I don't owe anybody anything. Right. I don't owe anybody shit. But I think it's and it's interesting because it, we walk through life and it's our looks. It's our looks. She, you, Julie, identified as black because in your world, you you were, I guess, more black. And, you know, you talked about how your mother was very like Afrocentric and we need to be very black. And when the Mormons came knocking, she said, this is a black household, which I thought that was so hysterical. I love that <laughs> part of the book. Um, uh, but I thought that was very interesting that it, it was a very long time until you were able to be in college and you found that mixed box that you could come into and identify with that you were like only on one side. And, and I heard you struggle with that because you were like, you know, I'm now able to not have to not identify with my white mom. So thank you for the book is what I'm trying to say. Long to the short. <laughs> Did you want to comment on that, Julie? Yeah, I would love to. I'm just, I'm like feeling all the feels. I appreciate you <laughs> sharing all of this. Oh. One of the great joys for me and being the author of this book is I've discovered that I am so not alone. Yes. And yeah. I kind of knew that as I aged, but boy, am I feeling it in uh, response to what I have written and the extent to which mm -hmm. it resonates with people. Um, so, um, and I have never felt it. I have never. It has been always very hard for me to feel and find people of mixed race that are like, yeah, I'm just mixed because I feel like most of us are forced to identify one right. way or the other. And it's usually dependent upon how we look. And it's interesting, right. too. Um, the play that I was watching yesterday is about a mulatto woman, and she looks very different from her mother. And I think the issues to that come with that are a whole set of everything because hair you talk a lot about hair mm -hmm. in this book Oof. which yeah. i completely get and understand but i personally don't on a personal level and i think it's because for me my mom is white my dad is black and so i feel like when it's a girl when mm -hmm. it's a woman and you're trying to identify with your mom and if you look so completely different than your mom like i would get like maybe stares i guess I don't really re recall anybody asking my mom, like, oh, is that your child? Like, we didn't look so much different, but I had darker features than her. But for the most part, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, she looks kind of like you or she could be your kid. So it wasn't that big of a deal. But I think it would I would have had a very nar different narrative had I looked much different. Yeah. And so yeah. for yeah. me, that was, it. like, it was never an issue. So I'm wondering if that's why it's easier for me to just say, forget it to everybody. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I am, um, so for those who don't know, my mother's white, my father's black, I married a white Jewish guy, <laughs> I've got two kids, my son is, I think, racially unambiguous, he's actually darker than me, a few shades, and his, his hair is kinky, and he wears an afro. My daughter, um, I think in many places, passes for white, she mm -hmm. resembles her dad a lot more, and mm -hmm. I think if you're attuned to racial intermixture, you, you know she's something, but you're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. what unless I show up with her so she gets the message that she doesn't belong to her brother who she adores mm. and he adores her or she gets the message she doesn't belong to me the message being who's that 
you know, when when someone sees her throw her arm around her brother, they think, "Are you dating him?" No, he's oh my, my brother. Gosh. What? Oh, How can he be your brother? Is the is what's behind the question? Keep you know, um, we are all hungry as humans to find belonging somewhere. We have mm-hmm. anthropologists tell us we have that innate need to join and belong, to know who we are, who our group is, and so on. And and we comprise a sense of belonging in all kinds of ways. Um, But when we are racially ambiguous, we learn from the start that something's wrong with us Mm because people can't figure out where we belong. And and then, yes, it does um, often fall to how we look Mm -hmm. as a signal to others as to whether we are them or we are not them. But someone like you, you know, you got the message from both sides. Hey, you know, you're you're too white to be black and you're too black to be you're too something to be white in the yep. white folks eyes they, they didn't know you were black yep. but they sure knew you weren't white right yep. and this gets to how embedded and then be, because america is so invested in the, the betterness of light skin and the worseness of dark skin mm-hmm. americans really need to know like what are you you mm-hmm. know where yeah. are you from because i need to know whether you're you know valued or not my journey to black it's a little bit more complex than than um than it might appear. So let me just try to summarize it. My parents told me I was black. I'm born in 1967. Mm-hmm. You know, parents, interracial parents were told then, raise your kid as black because they'll mm-hmm. be treated as black and she mm-hmm. better be black and proud. Mm-hmm. That wisdom is wise and it holds today. But my parents chose to raise me in all white towns uh, because my dad was a middle class physician and, you know, we could afford that. And so being raised in all white towns, I had no cultural touchstones to blackness. We weren't religious. We weren't members of the black church. Mm-hmm. My dad wasn't a part of a black fraternity. Mm-hmm. I didn't have black peers or mentors. So I really had television, you know, the bad news on TV right. about what's wrong with black folks and the occasional good news on TV, like from sitcoms right. about what black folks might actually be like. I was looking to the media for clues about what it meant that I was black. Mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't white. As a kid, nobody confused me for white. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel that as I've aged, people have started to confuse me for for white. I mean, I don't I don't know how that's possible. I'm staring at my skin, (laughs) which in my my hands, which are like chocolate brown, milk chocolate brown. My face is lighter, whatever. You know, um, I, I I've never been confused for white, but I chose biracial when it was offered as a linguistic option in the late 80s. It was yes. like, yes, yes. <laughs> finally a I way know. to explain why I'm so different yes. from the black folks, um, yes. and finally a way to stop denying my white mother. But I yes. realized that I was in part doing that to better myself, mm. that I was kind mm. of saying, well, I'm biracial. You know, I knew black was hated in America, and who wants to be hated? So here I am with a term right. that actually proves like, hey, I'm biracial. I have a mm-hmm. white parent. I am adjacent to white or white adjacent, mm-hmm. as we would say today. Mm-hmm. And um, part of me, I think, uh, subconsciously was really liking that piece. Yeah. You know, like, I'm only half as bad as you think because I'm actually no. half mm-hmm. white. Yes. Um, so I finally did the work to heal myself from mm-hmm. that self-loathing mm-hmm. that racism had, mm-hmm. you know, infused in me. And I came back to black claiming it authentically mm. for myself, not imposed upon me by my parents or by some rhetoric out there, but I actually mm. embraced my black yes. self. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I just, by discarding the self-loathing that had come from the racism, and I was able to say, I love my black self. Mm. Yes, I have a white mother, but I'm black in America. And that's mm-hmm. who I am, and I claim it, and I love it. Mm-hmm. And the beauty was, the minute I did that, and I try to describe this in a book, but this is one of those things that, you know, it's hard to write about. Mm. You know, I looked into the faces of my black colleagues and the black students on the Stanford campus the day after I had done this, you know, work essentially in therapy. And it was as if they all had gotten a memo saying, smile at Julie today. (laughs) It was like literally all the black people were smiling at me. And of course, they hadn't got a memo. It was that I was finally seeing and loving my black self. And therefore, I could see and love them. Yeah. And that may sound woo woo to people <laughs> listening, but I am no. telling you that yeah. that is literally what happened. And then I That's had awesome. people saying to me, older folks in the community, smile and nod and say to me, we've been waiting for you. Oh, we wow. were here all along. Wow. Oh, and my amazing. voice is breaking as I say this mm-hmm. because 
I had never felt yeah. one shred of that belonging from white folks. Well, yeah. awesome. And here were the black folks saying, we hoped we're you would wealthy. find your yeah. way home. Yeah. Well, yeah. And here they were. And it was yeah. the most exquisite thing. That's, what a that's fantastic. Well, that's, thank you that's for so writing yeah. so honestly. Yeah. Thank and I you. think it'll get, I'm hoping that it will get better as generations go on. Like I hope that I do a better job than my parents did in talking about it and being an open dialogue because my children look very different than me and their father and they're mixed. My husband is darker. And so, uh, you know, we just all look so different, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping that as time goes on that it won't be such a big deal. And I know I want to move on real quick, but I have two quick questions. I'm sorry up, about the book. I know. Run out of time. Okay. First of all, what happened to aunt Polly's mother, your aunt Polly, that she that got adopted. What happened to her mother, Julie? Um, so Aunt Polly um, was adopted essentially from the dump. Right. Uh, she had been injured by our family's my father's dog. Right. Badly injured, and my father's dad was a physician in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, serving the black community. You know, as one of the only black physicians. And he brought her home to heal her mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, bandaged her up and looked at the dump and said, she you know, I can't stay here, allow yeah. this child to go back to this dump where they live to heal and feeling responsible for the wound because his dog had inflicted it. He tenderly said to the mother, could she stay with us while, while she healed, mm -hmm. you know? And the mother agreed. The mother had many, many children. And, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, my family came and asked could we take her in mm -hmm. and the mother agreed yeah. saw that this was an opportunity for her daughter to have access to a better, better life, life. Right. i can't say any more than that because i don't know what happened oh, to aunt polly's okay. biological family aunt. so she yeah. just she just let her kind of go she was just like okay you have a good she life. was so young she yeah. was young the mother yeah. you know yeah and then my other yeah. last question is what was ruth's ethnic ethnicity your father's First wife, Ruth. First wife. Yeah. She was Cape Verdean, um, a mixture of the black folks on Cape Verde and the white folks on Cape Verde. Mm, so okay. she herself was was mixed, but with a phenotype that presented as kind of curly, kinky black hair mm -hmm. and kind of lighter, almost slightly freckled, not freckled, but a little bit, but lighter kind of, uh, but still black looking skin. Okay. So then your older siblings, because I don't... Like, I, I don't like, I was like trying to get a picture of them in the book. So right. do you feel like they're like right. a little bit darker than you? Like, do you think it was easier they're a for little them bit to... darker, a little bit kinky. It's really more the afros. Mm -hmm. It's gotcha. the kinky. The hair is a tighter coil. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I think our skin tone isn't all that different from one another. Um, you know, maybe I, I don't know. It's funny how she goes stare at a family <laughs> portrait now to do the analysis. But, you know, I try to get the visual. confusing them yeah. for you know they, right. they for didn't being white. have a white yeah. parent. Right. They right. didn't grow up. You right. Know, and that's they, and in reference. Actually, I was just trying to get the picture of it so that I can like say, okay, well, you couldn't really find solace in them because they couldn't really understand your yeah. plight and where you were coming from. So they I was more like, okay. you know, yeah. it was more that they were twenty years older than me. Right. They that, were from a different marriage. They were grown. They didn't grow up in a house with me. Not only that, they moved all over the country so i only saw them at thanksgiving maybe christmas and or thanksgiving right. and the occasional you know family wedding or something you know so they were right. like aunties and uncles um gotcha. but they they were not involved in my upbringing gotcha. and it's interesting because they've said to me those who are still alive i've lost one brother but the three of my father's children who are still living uh, very much alive have said to me I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea. Yeah. And I said, don't be sorry. I had no idea. You know, yeah, they were coming right. into their own consciousness. Mm -hmm, right. You know, as kids coming of age in the late 60s and early 70s in America, they didn't know what it was yeah. like for me. They probably thought it was easier for me because our family right, was right. more well off by then and we yeah. were living in quote unquote nicer places. They didn't, I don't think they had any, they, they weren't developed in their own psyche enough to know or to ask themselves right. what must it be like for Julie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, we're going to um, switch gears a little bit. I'm going to let you take a little break and I'm going to do the, our second commercial. Mm -hmm. And when um, I come back, then we can start talking about how to raise an, how adult. To raise an adult. That's and your second amazing book. Like what? You did Would you amazing read that? Book. that? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, our second sponsor, the show is also being brought to you by LA on cloud nine.org. LA on cloud nine is a nonprofit organization 
organization dedicated to the homeless community and their animals. They collaborate with multiple organizations to help connect people with housing, mental health, emotional support, animal certificates, <coughs> along with providing them with basic essentials such as hygiene items, food, and clothing. They conduct a youth program to help young minds understand the meaning and importance of service to community, as well as teaching them on how to deliver compassion and hope to those in their time of suffering and despair. They rely entirely on donations to serve the homeless population through throughout the entire Los Angeles area. For more information, and if you would like to donate, please visit www.la on cloud nine, the number nine, Dot org again www.la on cloud the number nine dot org what a great organization i know it's fantastic amazing. organization Wonderful. please visit their site okay so we're gonna t sh turn the page or close that book and open <laughs> this book <laughs> on to the next book <laughs> on to the next book that changed our lives yes um how to raise an adult <clears throat> literally changed my life alicia's yeah um for sure my first question to you is when this book came out did you get pushback from parents that said because when I read it, I thought, well, how do we make our kids competitive if we don't push? Mm. Did you get pushback from parents that say, you know, we have to push them because it's a competitive world, they're, they're competing with other people that are more brilliant, they need more of this, more of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> betcha. <laughs> Did I get pushback? Absolutely. Oh, and well. they said pretty much what you're saying. Um, and then I mm. responded like this. Okay. Um, Guiding our children is great. Inspiring our children is great. And mm -hmm. um, setting expectations that they will work hard is great. Mm -hmm. um, but when we cross the line and are starting to drag our children down their path, we're trying to drag them to the outcomes we have in mind. You know, you will be a this, you will study this, you will do this sport, what have you. We are effectively making them a very passive participant in their own life. Mm -hmm. We might get them mm -hmm. to that outcome we desire, but we have failed to allow them to develop the skills they'll need to thrive there. Yeah. And so short-term win, we got them there. Long-term cost, they're bewildered. They mm -hmm. can't do it. And then they're dependent upon us to really mm -hmm. keep dragging them. Or if it's not dragging, it's you know overly holding their hand. Right. And so um, it actually harms kids' mental health. So it's like, how badly do you want that outcome? Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. want to manufacture that outcome so badly that your Ugh. kid's mental health is compromised? No. You Terrible. know, what parent can really, you know, look in the mirror and say yes to that? Yeah. Did you want to say something? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had a quick question, too. Yeah. Um, so I understand what you're saying. And I agree with you. I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate here. But if you are in a school, high performing high school, let's say, or mm -hmm. elementary school, and the expectation is that kid has to perform in order mm -hmm. to stay there. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, you feel like, okay, we got to give you all the tools to make sure you get those A's and B's because this is where we mm -hmm. think is the best school for you. Most of us have, we all have our kids in private schools. Yeah. So private schools tend to be a little bit more uh, competitive and they push, push, push. So how do we find the balance with the school's expectation of our child and what we expect of our child? So um, <clears throat> you have to know your child. We want to give our kids all the tools, yes. And if we've got the resources such that we can be an independent school, awesome. Um, <clears throat> but we can't do our kids' homework for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to plainly say that because you know what? Parents well, are doing their kids' homework. Yes, yes. It's, and it's, it's shocking. It's them, to get the A's and B's. Yeah. To get the A's. And then they call yeah. the teacher. How'd you give us a B? We worked so hard on it. <laughs> right? Did I say yeah. that? And then they admit <laughs> inadvertently that they're actually doing their kids' homework. Yes. Okay? Why should you not do your kids' homework? Oh, because it's unethical. Oh, right, because right. the teacher doesn't end up knowing no what the kids actually know. And right. worst of all, it tells your kid you think they're incompetent yes, and right. can't be good enough to be successful in the fourth grade or the eighth grade or the eleventh grade, which really right. messes with them psychologically. Right. So we have to draw that line, okay? And if the kid isn't getting all A's and B's, you know, then you have to ask yourself, okay, maybe the kid's in the wrong classes. Maybe they can't handle all of this. Mm -hmm. right. Even everybody else can handle it doesn't mean my kid can. Maybe I can right. focus, have the guts to focus on my kid's actual strengths and help them be better at what they're naturally inclined toward by mm -hmm. way of their academic interests rather than act as if they have to be great at everything. Mm -hmm. See the right. kid you've got. Right. Nurture them to be the best version yes. of themselves rather yes. than... Right. 
you know, try to clip and prune them. I use a bonsai tree metaphor yeah, yes. <laughs> to resemble the, mm -hmm. I, the child you hoped you would have. Yeah, and, you know, try loving love. and yeah. supporting the child you actually have. Yeah, but I have to say, so in the defense of the helicopter parent, or maybe it's just in my defense, I don't care. Her Whatever. defense. Okay, in my defense. <laughs> this, okay, this is my thing. What I came to realize is that being I was I was on a career path and then I was like okay I'm gonna become a doctor and then okay I didn't really do that because I felt like I'm either gonna go to medical school or I'm gonna have a family I knew I was one of those type of people that couldn't be really great at two things I had to be really great at one thing so I chose to start a family and have children so for me I felt like I came from that world of being in school being at a job you get a review you get uh, you have a paper you get an A you work towards all of these goals parenting is a very different beast and nobody mm -hmm. tells you about it there's no class to take in college to prepare you for any of this crazy well we have her book now well yes now <laughs> and yes and, and by the way julie i give this book to like people <laughs> their baby showers because i'm like uh you need to read this book now while you have a little bit of time uh because you mm -hmm. are going to need this um and so i feel like for me myself i think i i came into this helicopter parenting as a way of trying to be the best parent i was trying to perfect perfect motherhood i was trying to perfect parenting because i was a perfectionist i always got great reviews i always got good grades in school and so it took me a very long time to understand that they are coming out <laughs> their own people but no one really tells you that and then when you get into school it's this whole other beast and it wasn't until i knew early on that my son learned differently and then that's when it clicked for me that like no matter what I did, it wasn't going to uh, change them mm -hmm. as who they are. Mm -hmm. And they have to be able to want it and to do it. And so it was hard for me because I saw all those parents helping their kids and doing their homework and, and I helped my child too, but I, I felt like I was doing him a disservice if I if I just did it for him. But I still struggle because, you know, as a parent, you wanna give your child everything, you wanna give them every opportunity and you wanna make their life easy. Um, but it's just a fine balance of where you draw, Julie, where you go uh, over that line. <laughs> tell her, thank you, tell Julie. her, Julie, Lisa. please, please, girl. <laughs> We're counting on you, Julie. Yeah, help us, you. help I, us. I'm just like holding your heart and your <laughs> spirit right now in please my arm. Her. Okay, you have just uttered the most beautiful testimony to why we overparent, and I mm -hmm. say we because anyone who's mm -hmm. listening to me give a talk knows I yep. own up to a lot of my helicopter parenting and I'm not sure I'm even aware of all of it okay <laughs> so I am right. in this with you I'm in the struggle for perfection with you let me ask you this I mean don't answer it but I will I will in response to what you said you you were accustomed to school and job and review and getting an yep. A on a paper and all of yep. that with some third party telling you you were good enough yep. right. and so then you search for that in parenting and yep. motherhood yep. how can I still meet with the external approval of other people exactly. and it has become the fashion to over parent yep. do the kids homework rescue them every time they forget something yep. you know argue with the teacher argue with the coach mm -hmm. that's become in communities like yours and mine the evidence that you are a great parent yep. okay yep. and then um, what we end up doing is um, letting our need our egos need for validation, mm -hmm. you know, to be regarded as good enough and successful, yeah. we let our kids' lives become the evidence we need of our own worth, yep. which messes them up yep. psychologically. Hallelujah. We have to mm -hmm. stop. It is unhealthy for any human to feel that they are basically belonging to the second human, the parent. You know, yeah. like, yes. I am your pet. Nope. I am your project. Right. If I run or march or jump in the right way, you feel good about yourself. It is terribly harming to our children to make mm -hmm. them feel this way. Mm -hmm. We don't intend to make them feel this way, but that is in effect how they feel mm -hmm. when we, because they, they can sense that we feel better about ourselves mm -hmm. when we can say, oh, you got an A or oh, you're on this yep. soccer team or what have you. Yep. And you uttered another beautiful thing. When we have a child with learning differences, we learn earlier than those who don't have a child with learning differences to be humble, to realize I might have wanted this kid to be a brain surgeon, but my kid's got some challenges that probably yeah, make yeah. that, you know, not likely, but I'm going to love the heck out of this kid yep. for who he or she is and help them grow to be the best self they can be. And that humility yeah. 
is something that ought to attend every parent's approach yeah, yeah, to yeah. every child. Every yeah. child is different, and they are not our mini-me. How can we step back, get our egos out of it, yeah. and just take a real curious interest in who this kid is, how can I teach them to work hard? How can I teach them to be kind and loving to others? Yes. That's basically what they need to emerge from our mm-hmm. home. And no matter knowing. what their path is, no matter yeah. what their path is. They're on loan to us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, they yeah. are. They are. I, I love that. I want to yeah. read something you wrote on page 24 about bullying, which I thought was, I read it again and again, and I thought, wow, this is something that is uh, an eye opener. Mm-hmm. You said, when you label another child a bully, particularly a little child, you're imposing intentions that child simply isn't developmentally capable of. Exactly. Mm. And I thought that was, re- that is incredibly powerful because we are quick to label any child, mm-hmm. at any, any age. child, at, at, any at, age, at any age, at any age, a bully without, mm-hmm. because they're either confronting our child or our child is feeling less than or mm, whatever yeah. the situation mm-hmm. is, we immediately, so how do we sh- create that shift that even the schools would understand that? Mm-hmm. I mean, how do, where do we start with that? Yeah. Yeah, it's such a huge, uh, it's become this rhetorical tick we call everything bullying. Mm-hmm. Um, and b- real bullying is terrible, and and, uh, and I'm not a fan of bullying, don't get me wrong, um, but bullying is the systemic degradation of a person. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, whereas there's a whole lot of bad behavior in childhood uh, that kids exhibit on their way toward, you know, learning how they need to interact with other humans, that we have to be more tolerant of and educate people around mm. um, because that's the only way they grow and learn. Here's a wonderful counter example. Um, it's not quite about bullying, but it is, well, it is, um, let me just describe it. There's a, there's a school in New Zealand whose principal said, you know what, our playground at our elementary school lists you know, a bunch of rules. Don't climb a tree, don't climb the fence, Mm -hmm. Don't touch anybody else. Don't throw a ball in it. You know, all of these rules. And he said, we've got bullying still going on. We've got injuries. He said, I'm tired of all these rules. I think they are constraining children in a way that inhibits their growth, Mm -hmm. their physical growth and their social and emotional growth. Mm -hmm. So he said, the only rule is uh, you can't intentionally hurt someone. Okay. Mm. Every other rule went away. And, you know, people were worried and gasping and, oh, no. And you know what happened? <laughs> Bullying went down. Injuries went down. Wow, As kids were allowed to climb and fall and mm. climb again, they mm-hmm. got stronger. Yep, you know, yeah. as they were allowed Resilience. to work out yeah. their differences on the playground, yeah. they got more adept at working things out. Yeah. So he gave back to children the opportunity to build skills that these blanket rules actually impede our kids from developing. Yeah. And how, and how the, the very definition of bullying, if, I don't know if you have ever read mm-hmm. Bully Nation, which she referenced, but if you read it, how the definition of bullying has so changed into something mm-hmm. else since we were growing up. Mm-hmm. It's, now it's, yeah. you know, you're not going to let your kids sit at the lunch table. Oh, my God, that's a bully. Mm. Yeah. Okay. No, well, yeah. you know, that not so much. not a bully. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much. And I think kids yeah. have to learn how to deal with yeah. situations and things in their yeah, life. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you're going to grow up and have to deal with humans at, at, at mm-hmm. your job, yep. at school, at call. I mean, it's part of life. It's okay. Life yeah. So what happens, and I speak of me, after you realize <laughs> you have overparented a child? Like, how, how do you undo that be- Like, you rang that bell. How do you unring it? Unring it. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah, what do you do? So um, there's a wonderful phrase that we need to be deploying a whole lot more often during childhood, but especially with our 20-somethings. Um, and it is this. When they call or text us with, a, with what we would consider as adults to be a run-of-the-mill problem, mm-hmm. now, I'm not talking about an emergency now. I'm talking about a natural problem that cropped up in life the best thing we can do is this two-step response. Number one, empathize. You say, wow, honey, that's really unfortunate, or I'm so sorry to hear that happened, or that Mm -hmm. must sting, or whatever the right empathic response is. And then you Mm -hmm. say, how do you think you're going to handle it? (laughs) And in that Mm -hmm. response, you are signaling, (laughs) it's not mine to handle, and I think you are capable of handling it. And that dual message is essential for them to hear. Um, because we've basically trained mm-hmm. them to rely upon us for everything. For the answers. Now, you don't cold turkey stop delivering all the, all the solutions. If you've mm-hmm. got an older child you're overparented, you ought to sit them <laughs> down, look them in the eye, and say, Honey, I've realized that though I acted with the best of intentions, um, I think I have overhelped you in ways that mean you have fewer skills now mm-hmm. than you might have had had That's I not good. been so helpful. Right. So here's the thing. We need to start building. You need to start, not we. <laughs> you need to start building <laughs> skills. Yeah. 
And yeah. so the way you build skills are, first you do it for them, which you've been doing all their life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Next you do it with them, mm-hmm. meaning they're there, but you're doing yeah. all the work. Okay. You, you have to them. move to step three, which is you watch, watch them, them do it. You've yeah, been right. next to them doing all the stuff of life for them. You turn the tables. You say, now, kid, you know, let me be near you as you try this. Making yeah. a meal, paying a bill, right. filling out forms, talking to a stranger in the grocery store. And then finally you can move to step four as they're finally capable of doing it without you. You have to practice a lot yeah. of step okay. two and step three to get to step four. So and that can, takes some time. So we can go back because I know that you referenced that early on for younger kids. So basically just go back. Just restart. Just hit the restart <laughs> button and... Just, but look them in the eye and own up to it. <laughs> and don't be overly, you're not trying to be their best friend. I mean, that's one of the problems in our modern parenting. Oh, God, you might be inclined uh, to say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. No. I won't. This is right, the best. Right, right. You don't I'm understand. It's really hard to me. There was no manual. Don't do that. Yeah. Look them in the eye and say, you know what? I've made some mistakes. I realize I've overhelped and it might have undercut uh, you. your chances at having the skills you want to have right about now in life. Mm-hmm. So... Um, with that said, we got to start focusing on the kids, on the things you need to know how to do. Let's pick three things that yeah. you want to learn and let me teach you. And then we can both have confidence that you know how to do it yourself. Yeah. Be intentional. Yeah. So one thing that I want to talk about before we run out of time is this amazing phrase word. I don't know what you call it, <laughs> but it was like revolutionary eye opening for me. Like oh, I have like this whole entire page on page 145 um, of your book, How to Raise an Adult. Um, you speak of self-efficacy. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. This is a word. Yes, it's that a great, I love. A great word. I just I don't know why, but when I read this, I was just like bells started going off in my ears because it gave a com- a, a precise and very different explanation to self-esteem because okay, this is what we see that every child, every person needs self-esteem, and people generally tend to be more damaged when they have lower self-esteem. And so we're always chasing, I feel like we're always chasing as parents, give them good self-esteem, make sure they have good self-esteem. Well, okay, well, how do you do that? Like, it's not up to me to give you self-esteem. The word self is in the damn word. So what am I supposed to do with that? But this self-efficacy is just, I'll let you explain it because I, I, I you wrote it. <laughs> so you could probably okay. explain it more eloquently, but I just love it. It is beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful and, thing. Um, look, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a lawyer turned university dean turned writer. And so I have done a lot of work at learning uh, about the various um, concepts that are the underpinnings of the hunches I had as a concerned dean, you know, and parent here in Silicon Valley, like looking at what was happening to our kids. So self-efficacy is basically the the understanding we must have as an individual that I exist. Mm -hmm. You know, the individual needs to be aware of its own existence. It sounds very um, philosophical and somewhat tautological. It's like, of course you know exist, you're you. But no, self-efficacy, this sense of our own existence is built by seeing that our actions have outcomes. Mm -hmm. Our actions have results. That's one key way we know we exist. So when we overhelp our kids, when we're overprotective toward receive, achieving an outcome, when we're overdirective, like we're directing them toward that outcome, we're mm-hmm. kind of making it happen, or we're overly handholding and concierging their life, you know, to get to that outcome, the psyche, the kid's internal psychological self knows, I didn't get to this outcome on my own. Right. Therefore, we have undermined the development of self-efficacy, which leads to higher rates of anxiety and depression, which I don't have to tell you, are really hitting alarming rates in the mm-hmm. adolescent and young right adult now. population. Oh, yeah. It's all related there. In fact, studies linking the over-involved parenting style with these higher rates of anxiety and depression and a lack yeah. of self-efficacy is at the heart of it. Yeah. So, like it or not, we have to let our children do something and see the results of it and not jump off a bridge do something not drown in the right, ocean right, right, right? right there are things we right. must step right. in and prevent right, but exactly. we've decided every little thing must be stepped in and prevented or every little thing must be aided and that messes with their ability to develop self-efficacy yep. yes oh yes. my goodness yeah. gracious yeah. Okay, can I ask yeah, one? Yeah, quick of course. Yes, of course. Julie, I'm curious um, what your what your take is on the enormous, and I don't know how it is over where you are. Um, th- right now, it seems there seems to be a growing trend in the enormous amount of homework that's given, 
it's, it's almost as if they're trying to catch up with some sort of a race against Europe to give like three hours, four hours. It's, it seems to be getting more and more and more as the grades go higher. And, and I'm curious to hear what your take on that is. And do you believe that it is necessary? Yeah. Heidi, um, I'm going to cite an amazing organization called Challenge Success. You can find them at challengesuccess.org. It's a nonprofit that's spun out of the research of Denise Pope, who's on the faculty at Stanford School of Education. Challenge Success is working in communities like yours and mine to help schools and parents and kids really figure out, you know, how can we offer rigor and um, without and also value our kids' mental health and wellness. So on this website, challengesuccess.org, yes. you can go to their menu tab resources. And pull down a white paper on homework okay. where uh, mm -hmm. Professor Denise Pope has um, written a paper aggregating a bunch of homework studies that were done. Okay. And her conclusion is this. Do not confuse rigor with load. Mm. More mm. homework does not mean more rigorous yeah. work. Yeah. Okay. There's a whole lot of busy work being assigned. In my mm -hmm. kid's community, my kid was doing five hours of homework a night as a sophomore at a very, very wow. rigorous public school here in Palo Alto. And I had to be the parent who could step in and say, even though I know he's supposed to do all of this and take all these classes and get A's in all of them, in order to be admitted to the right colleges, quote unquote, <laughs> right. this is sucking mm. the life out of my kids. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I have to be the parent who says, I don't care if everyone else is subjecting their children to this. Yeah. My kid matters more right. to me yeah. than what college he gets admitted to. Absolutely. And I profile, I talk about this when I give my talks. Absolutely. You might have heard this at Sierra Canyon. Yeah. You know, I go there. And I say this, if it's, you know, there's too much, there is such a thing as too much homework. Teenagers yeah. aren't sleeping. Yeah, there's exactly. no time for dinner with family. Exactly. There's no time for friends. Mm -hmm. All of these things matter. We, mm -hmm. We're treating childhood mm -hmm. like it's some endurance race. And it leaves many of them absolutely exhausted, burned yeah. out, brittle, fragile. Yeah, and awful. homework is a huge part that's of that awful. problem. So check out that white paper and advocate to your school yes. that they really examine what's the purpose of homework. Can yeah. the teachers get together and figure out who's assigning homework and who's not? Right. Maybe move to a block schedule so the kids <laughs> don't have seven classes a day exactly. assigning homework. They have three or four classes or a day. Eight. You know, yeah. these tools that Challenge Success recommends that can really make life a lot yeah. more Livable. Wow, livable. that yes. was priceless. Yes. Thank you. I will do just that. Livable. Thank you, Julie. Having a livable life. Well, yeah. you know what? We, we ran out of time. No, oh I could talk gosh. to her for hours. I know. We, we could do I'm another sorry. hour. I know I'm long winded, but I. No, I no, 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 no. So much, and I don't want to give the soundbite answer. Oh, no, no, no. Awesome. This no. has been wonderful. We've got a couple of comments on Facebook, but yes. we can't get to right now. But I people know, are sorry. thrilled. They have questions for you. I don't know, but I feel like we have to do another hour. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Yes. and your busy morning to have a conversation with us. This feels very much like a conversation. Absolutely. And we're just honored to have had you on our program, and yes. we will continue to read and I, share yeah. this book with the world. Get the best <laughs> ghost books. Y'all, Tamika, Tamika on Facebook is asking about colleges that change lives. Yes. And I will tell Tamika that, yes, it's an amazing alternative college rankings list, mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. alternative to U.S. News. Go check out Colleges That Change Lives. 40 okay. small schools where everybody yes. who goes there says, my gosh, this place changed my life. DTCL.org. My son is at one of them. I can give you no better endorsement. So than is that. that a website? Nice. Is that a website? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. great. DTCL.org. Colleges that change lives. Yes. Yay. And there is a lot of, uh, I mean, your book, Just How to Raise an Adult, is uh, has a plethora of information yes. for colleges and different colleges and alternatives to like your big schools and the pressure and like we could just talk for 15 minutes just on the pressure that you know we're putting on ourselves <laughs> and our know. children to go to schools and you're not really you're doing your children a disservice by not understanding them and finding a school that's a good fit for them yeah so with that i will say everyone needs to go out and buy both books both listen, books. Amazing. Yes. listen this one needs to go for like uh baby showers and oh, i don't know required, at the wedding. required reading just give it to them at the wedding <laughs> they're gonna have kids that's yeah, what i, I tell everybody and i really congratulations book. in bates college for putting yes. your book Yay. on their uh, curriculum. I think not that book. Yeah, no, real American. Real yeah, American. Yeah, I'm, hold, yeah right. I'm holding it up. Yeah. Um, and okay. I just, I think everybody, I think all humanities or African American studies or should have yes. should read this book. I so think every empathize. person, every human being needs to read that book. Um, but listen, <laughs> we are out of time, Julie. I'm going to ask you to hold the line real quick, and we are going to yeah, yeah. sign off. Yes, we hope you've Thank been you informed, uh, educated, and entertained. We'll catch you next Monday here on LA Talk Radio. Have a great rest of the week. Bye. Bye.
You're listening to Table for Five with Felicia and Annette only on LA Talk Radio. 